Hello and welcome back to Chiefs of Finance Live Lounge, where we speak and interview some of the best, brightest, and most successful senior finance leaders across Canada. This is Episode 7, and I'm your host, Artie Asadi, Managing Director of Halcyon Finance and Accounting Recruitment. And today we are so, so happy and excited to be joined by Ross Wong. For those you may not know, Russ is currently the CFO of ADP Canada, ADP obviously being one of the world's largest payroll and human capital management service providers, and actually pays, I believe, more than one, um, more than one in four Canadians in the private sector. Pri- prior to joining ADP, Russ was the CFO of Chubb Edwards, where he helped integrate an acquisition that doubled the size of the business, and from 2001 to 2009, he was the CFO of Lexmark Canada with overall responsibility for financial matters, supply chain and logistics, IT, as well as the call centers. Russ is a CMA CPA and holds an uh, MBA from the Rotman School of Management, uh, University of Toronto, and with so many outstanding accomplishments under his belt, we couldn't be more uh, excited to have him on the live lounge today. So thank you so much for joining us, Russ. Uh, thanks very much for uh, having me, Artie. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Russ, we usually like to get right into it and, um, you know, ask, the, the the most pressing question for for all our listeners, and that's uh, if you're able to describe your career milestones that you believed helped shape and prepare you to become a senior finance leader. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Um, I think the first place to start is you know describe a little bit about my career path, and in, in, in that you know it was a not a nice you know linear upward sloping uh, line. Um, I've kind of always held the belief and, and managed my, my career from standpoint of, hey, I want to make a difference uh, and I want to acquire new skills, whether they are within finance or not. Um, so when you think about, you know, when I think about some career milestones, you know, if I start right at the beginning, right, being a financial analyst at, uh, at Lexmark and thinking back about, you know, trying to make a difference in acquiring new, new skills, um, even as a financial analyst, uh, on inventory, uh, I really got into systems, and that sort of led, you know, into you know becoming an assistant controller. Um, a key milestone was after that, um, you know, doing well as an assistant controller, um, getting my first controller and management position at Lexmark. Um, so always, you know, having a key, you know, that, that first uh, management role, I think, is, is key in, in a career. And then from there, um, I branched out um, beyond the accounting uh, and beyond the, fan, uh, the finance into project management and systems implementation. So, you know, doing an ERP implementation, and that took a year and a half, uh, and that was, you know, a key milestone. And then from there, getting finance systems operational experience. And all of those finance, the operational, the systems experience, you know, really led to my first CFO role and senior financial leader role. Wonderful. So um, what I'm hearing there is, you know, essentially from Lexmark, started from an NFA into assistant controller from that, moved into controller and management, and then branching off outside of just uh, solely numbers and accounting and moving into the project side and, and systems implementation, getting an overall picture of, of how, you know, everything's integrated and, uh, and the operations that, that lead to everything. Um, and for, for you, was that, um, you know, that sort of progression, especially from Lexmark, which is, you know, obviously very quickly you sort of move between the different positions, was that always your goal to become the CFO of, a, of an organization? Yeah, to be honest, um, no, I was not, you know, I, I think, you know, some folks from a career standpoint, it, it's great to be laser focused um, on a particular opportunity and then you can identify what gaps you need in order to get there. I actually didn't manage my my career from that standpoint. Um, I always kind of believed if you make a difference um, and you do a great job, kind of opportunities will open up. And then, you know, as long as those opportunities, I would assess them based on, you know, am I learning something new? Is it really interesting? Um, And I kind of, you know, focused on gaining new skills as opposed to a particular role. Now, it just so happened that, you know, becoming a CFO, um, you know, uh, ended up becoming a CFO, which is kind of a traditional path, but it wasn't solely focused on that. And and in fact, um, for a t- 
time, um, after the successful ERP implementation, after I took that project management role, I actually wanted to become a CIO. So I, for a short time there, you know, left Lexmark and I took a business systems manager role for an organization called Sunbeam. And, you know, I was going to become, uh, you know, going down that systems route. But then an opportunity opened back up at Lexmark and, you know, the CFO role became available. And again, I thought about it and then I jumped back in and, and uh, became a CFO. So. It wasn't always to become a CFO. I would just wanted to continue to learn, whether it was you know, from a, a technology standpoint or a finance standpoint and how it could contribute. Okay. Terrific. And would you think, uh, would you say it was your natural curiosity um, to move into IT and systems that had the biggest influence in your career and, and the movements you, you've made? Or is it, you know, someone, what, what, what's been the biggest influence in your career to date and, um, you know, from moving from uh, an FA to the project side back to CFO? Um, I don't know if I could single out one, um, you know, particular influence. Um, I've had, you know, multiple people who I've learned from um, I've worked for multiple presidents, and, and each one of them, for example, they have different leadership styles. They, uh, you know, are international, um, you know, uh, employees, um, you know, from versus, you know, I say a Canadian uh, president. Um, so, so I've kind of, you know, been influenced by by each of them. I've had some mentors, a number of mentors, um, in in uh, throughout my career, um, but I've also learned from. From the, my, my peers as well, so you know, the influences. You know, I've been guided by. Hey, just you need to continue to to develop and acquire you know, skills, uh, and not just be the finance and accounting person. Um, and so I think mm-hmm. that has you know that kind of guiding principle has had the biggest influence. Uh, you know, on how I have moved from careers and from uh, you know each of my roles. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's uh, it seems, you know, like a great progression, and you hit on uh, some key points that I'd, I'd love to speak to you further down this conversation in terms of mentors and and some of the leaders that that uh, have assisted and guided your your learning and progression. Um, so essentially, I mean, coming from a, a company such as uh, Chubb Edwards uh, from CFO and VP of Finance, there, um, moving into ADP, what was what was essentially your your philosophy of finance when you arrived at ADP? What job did you want to create for yourself? Where did you sort of see and envision the team going? Yeah, well, so I came into ADP as the uh, chief financial officer. Um, and, you know, the philosophy and, and, you know, what I wanted to create here, um, you know, was really about the, the environment and how finance could be, you know, a valued business partner. Uh, and at the same time, you know, be responsible for the, you know, the guardianship role that traditionally finance has. Um, and something that I've, you know, that's guided me and I've helped, you know, shape over my, my career is I, I use uh, a finance value-add model. So whenever I uh, go into an organization, this is what I use. I use this model um, to help. Uh, assess and you know set the uh, the direction for uh, the finance organization and and I've developed that you know over 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 my career that's excellent I'm sure maybe after listening to this you may get contacted <laughs> about that but uh, no absolutely no, I'd be happy like to share them all but it's uh, kind of hard to do on a on a phone call but I would course. be happy to yeah. share how I do that yeah no absolutely I'll, uh, if any listeners are, are wanting to, to hear that, certainly reach out uh, to me and I could uh, assist you in, in obtaining that from Russ. So it seems like a, a really great way to sort of come in and, and, um, and add that value add and, and um, you know, really get it high, get the department high performing as soon as you, you sort of get there, which is, uh, you know, I, I wanted to, to lead on from, uh, you, you mentioned uh, a few different points there, I, and we, I didn't mention in, in the introduction, but um, you know, not many people probably are aware listening to this, that you actually held uh, the interim 
presidency at uh, at ADP for uh, about the last six months until December of last year. Um, so, w- could you uh, elaborate a little bit on on that? How how that experience was? Like, what sort of background you think really helped you get that um, interim pres- presidency? And was it you know how your finance experience lended to to guiding the ship for for the six months that you were in the in the seat? Yeah, a- a- absolutely. So, um, and just a little bit of background. So, you know, I joined ADP. Uh, past my uh, two-year anniversary um, back in, in December. And, uh, yeah, for the last six months, uh, I was the interim president um, uh, running ADB Canada, and it was an absolute fantastic experience. And if you think back, uh, and I, if I think back to how did I even, um, you know, ha- have that opportunity become available to me, it is really as a result of, you know, not just being the finance, um, you know, person. So, um, you know, one thing I always say to my my finance folks is, you know, a, a, a good financial analyst understands the numbers, right? But a, but a great financial analyst understands the business. And if you kind of look at my career, and I've, you know, it's not been solely based on finance. You know, I have and and actively sought out opportunities to become involved in the operations of the business, to be you know involved in the logistics, the the systems and and the technology piece as well. And I think all of those things, you know, coupled with you know, finance professionals need to be you know, good at building relationships, um, you know, to be able to network and partner with, like, the sales organization, as an example. And I think those things help lead me to, you know, being offered the, the opportunity to run the organization um, while we searched for a, uh, you know, a, our next uh, president. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't agree more. And, and do you think your, your MBA from Rotman School of Management helped with uh you know being able to prepare you for for uh that uh presidency position do you think anyone moving away you know has aspirations to move from possibly a CFO to a CEO or you know into more of an operational seat in, uh would uh benefit or requires an MBA in your opinion um let me answer it this way i for myself um you know getting an MBA was probably one of the best things and one of the best decisions that I ever made. Um, and it's not so much about the content that you learn. Um, it, absolutely, you can. You know, you know, you if you've gone to business school, um, you know, you take a lot of the the same courses. Um, but it's not so much the content. Um, you have a different perspective on things. You're you're there for a different reason in, in terms of you know pure learning as opposed to maybe your undergrad degree. You're primarily focused on you getting the best grades that you can because you know, best grades correlate to, you know, good jobs and, and salary and so on. Um, uh-huh. The MBA was really important from the standpoint of the, the connections that I made. Um, and, you know, it taught a lot about the soft skill side. So when you think about, you know, gaps that maybe finance professionals might have, um, you know, it's on the leadership uh, side as an example. And the MBA was tremendous in just, helping, you know, shape my thinking around leadership, around, um, you know, those soft skills. And definitely I think that was a uh, positive uh, contribution, you know, you know and, and helping me get to, to where I am in my career. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, it's, it's such a beneficial tool. Uh, to have, and you learn so much, um, and, and you sort of alluded to not, not so much the, the actual uh, information you may learn, but, you know, peer learning and, and um, you know, having that sort of network of, of people to, to you know, work aside and, and learn from in the leadership side, which is great. You know, that could be a whole episode on, on itself. But, uh, you know, for, you, you mentioned uh, one very um, prominent point about a good FA understands the numbers, but a great FA understands the business. Is there, um, 
any other advice that you could give aspiring accountants wanting to, to become senior finance leaders? And, and what sort of obstacles do you, do you feel are, are holding people back from what you've seen to, to progress, to progression? Yeah, I think from an advice standpoint is, you know, get out of just being an accountant or being a, a finance uh, professional and, you know, learn the business. So job shadow, uh, some things I've done is, you know, I've, I've job shadowed with, you know, call centers, with sales reps, with folks in the warehouse to really understand, um, you know, the business. Um, you know, some of the biggest obstacles that I, I think, you know, accountants and finance professionals have to work on um, are, you know, outside of the technical skills. You know, for example, here, here at ADP, right, we have a, you know, a leadership model um, where we kind of look at business leadership and, and people leadership and market leadership. And, and if I think about kind of those three, three things, the, the business leadership, typically accountants are really good, you know, the, the finance management and even, you know, strategy that goes along with, the, with the, that, that business. Um, but on the people side and, and the market side, you know, thinking about, you know, the communication and having impactful communication or being able to, to build world-class teams and, and develop talent. Um, you know, those are some of the things that I think may not come naturally to accounts who are, you know, I will generically describe as, as you know, introverted as an example. And similarly on the market side, you think about client focus and having that, that uh, outside-in perspective, I think that's where, you know, uh, finance professionals, you know, need to put some additional effort in to, you know, becoming, uh, you know, a, a overall business leader. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I, I think what you mentioned, really getting getting stuck in and learning the business. And if you have an opportunity to job shadow and, and going sit with other business units and business heads, re- really does make a, uh, an impact. And, you know, on the side of, of introversion, we, we do deal with that a lot in, uh, in the accountancy. But, you know, I, I believe you, I'm sure you would agree that if you wanted to really, really progress, you really sometimes need to step outside your comfort zone and, and um, you know, have those strong communication skills that you're able to relay the message of, of the com- business and the company to, to all yeah. of the stakeholders that, that are listening. Yeah, Ari, that's a, that's a great point. And something I forgot to mention is, is you know, stepping out of your, your comfort zone, um, force yourself to do that. Um, and I, I absolutely took steps to do that. I knew that, for example, presentation skills and being able to, uh, you know, communicate and sell your ideas or present to a board or to the executive um, was really important. And, you know, that is not a skill that came naturally to me. Um, it's something I continually work on, but it's, I found opportunities and forced myself into those situations, you know, to practice that skill, get better, and so it becomes a little more natural um, every time I do it. Mm-hmm. And, no, those are great points, and so happy for you to, to share those because, you know, a lot of people just think, you know, that's not me, I can't do it, but when they hear from people such as yourself, it may have not naturally been that person, but, you know, obviously now uh, the CFO of a, uh, of a multinational company, and, um, you know, absolutely we're holding the, the Canadian presidency, which is, you know, speak, speaks volume from, you know, probably where you were to where you are now, which is which is great. Um, now, f- for yourself, what, what sort of things do you, now back in the CFO seat, um, would you say you struggle with or, or maybe a challenge uh, on most on a daily basis as a, as a CFO? And do you feel these are typical of most senior finance leaders? Yeah, I think in, in you know, I've had three CFO roles in throughout my career, and in all of them, one thing that I struggle with is, is that, you know, balance of time between, you know, the operational focuses and, and the strategic items. Um, and ideally, I always try and, and, and you want to spend more time on those strategic priorities. But that allocation of time, you know, 
dealing with the fires uh, and the day-to-day -day issues which are important is something that I particularly have have uh, challenged, uh, you know, been challenged with. Um, and so those things about, you know, developing your team and, and talent, which is strategic, making sure, you know, we're thinking always about the future. It's very easy to, especially being in finance, you know, to look at your variances and talk about, you know, the history, of, uh, you know, the, of the performance, what went up, what went down. But, you know, that's what not the focus needs to be. It needs to be, you know, in the future looking um, on, you know, the actions that we got to take to continue to drive the success of the business forward. And, and I think, you know, really being conscious of that and trying to carve out time to make sure that I'm focused on those strategic items is always something that, uh, you know, has, has been a challenge. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think it's, uh, it's, it's a very valid point across the board you know, within finance and, and other industries, it's so important to to have that focus and, and um, organization to be a lot more um, uh, proactive rather than reactive. So I, I, I can certainly say that um, it's probably not for you, but uh, definitely across the board. But uh, it's great for you to share that, so people know that it's it's not just uh, it's not just for them. And um, you know, Russ, for for you, obviously, you know, such a high profile job and. A lot, um, you know, you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. How do you, how do you like to unwind after a high-pressure or stressful day when you get home? <laughs> yeah, um, you know, what keeps me grounded and what I enjoy doing the most and helps with my stress is just being with my family. So I've got, mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, my, my two kids who are not so much kids anymore because they're <laughs> they're, they're almost uh, adults. But being able to spend time with them, their activities, um, whether it's being hockey or music or so on, that really, really helps and takes me away and gets my mind off of the business and, you know, um, focused on, you know, probably what's the most important is, 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 is my family. Good. It's, uh, it's great, uh, great to see that and, and hear that. So it's awesome. And um, ultimately, I, I wanted to ask you earlier, but, you know, when – Spending six months uh, as a as in the presidency seat, where do you ultimately is that something that you'd love to to get into one day, stepping more outside of finance and into, um, you know, maybe a CEO role or, or the president's role? Do you do you feel that something that's in your future? Yeah, so I think that's absolutely one possibility. Um, I am very interested, having done that for the last six months, being stretched being in that role and looking at the business from the the overall perspective of being ultimately responsible um, and being able to do it for you know half a year um, you know I love doing that role absolutely so I think that is that is a possibility but you know like my and, and how I've managed my career uh, throughout is that I haven't solely been focused on one thing. So um, that is one possibility. Um, you know, international roles from, uh, you know, finance uh, perspective is uh, also another possibility. Um, I love operations and managing the business from that perspective. So, you know, an operations type focused role is also a possibility. Um, and it, it kind of is, is still the guiding principles that uh, you know I've used you know right from the beginning of my career to even today about just being able to acquire new skills um, and trying to make a difference. So as opportunities come up, I will assess them and uh, look at that from that uh, from that perspective. So it could be could be CEO, could be you know operations, could be international finance. Um, you know, the, the opportunities, uh, I think, are, are exciting from, from all those aspects. Yeah, absolutely. I don't think you you're, um, will certainly be limited in, in options, uh, having accomplished so much in your, in your great career. So, um, you know, I, will, I know the, the future will be bright for you, and uh, I wish you all the, all the best there. And uh, any final piece of advice? You've shared so much already. Any final piece of advice for those aspiring leaders that you could share with our listeners today? No, I, I think we've probably talked about a number of things. I think to maybe summarize a couple of things, um, you know, step out of your comfort zone, all right, and, and 
force yourself to acquire those new skills, which is uncomfortable. Um, I would also say, you know, particularly in, in finance, um, you know, ask for what you want. So part of early on, you know, I probably had a view that, hey, if you do a great job, you know, people will notice you and, and then, you know, opportunities will just flow your way. Um, that may not be always the case. I would think that, you know, as finance, let's go out, let's sell ourselves, and if you see an opportunity, ask for it. Declare, and, and that way people, there's no mistake about, you know, understanding what your, your intentions are. And I think that's something that I've also learned to do. And um, I think that had I had that advice earlier on in my career, I think would also have been, uh, been helpful. That's, uh, I, I think that's probably one of the most powerful pieces of advice you've shared with us uh, today. Just, you know, go out and ask yourself, and even though you're, you're doing great work, you still need to take that action to, to um, be seen, but, you know, things aren't probably going to come to you as, as you expect. So step outside your comfort zone and, uh, and go, go get it. Ross, um, you know, once again, I want to thank you so much for your for your time today. I think the listeners are going to get so much out of this, and um, you know, I really appreciate you joining us. Thanks, Artie. I appreciate the opportunity. All right, take care. Okay, thanks, Artie. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Take care. Bye bye.